Uh, good morning. I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Steve Allman as our Grand Round speaker this morning. He's our 2019 Caldwell Visiting Professor. Um, as many of you know, uh, Dr. Jim Caldwell was a former division head here and established this visiting professorship to bring a national leader to UW every year uh, with a focus on fellow education. Um, Dr. Allman, uh, we had a great opportunity yesterday, the fellows, to interact with him and over dinner last night. A couple fun facts about Dr. Allman. He grew up in a small town in central Illinois called Normal. Um, Normal has about 50,000 people. And a couple fun facts about this that I found out from Wikipedia. The first Steak and Shake opened in Normal, Illinois in 1934. And they have a minor league baseball team. The, the name of the team is the Normal Corn Belters. <laughs> and the Normal Corn Belters play in a stadium called the Corn Crib. So uh, Dr. Allman had, his, had some early medical exposure as a phlebotomist. And then from there, he did his biomedical engineering degree at Northwestern and medical school at Mayo. He stayed on there for his internal medicine residency, cardiology fellowship, and has stayed on as uh, faculty since then. So he now directs the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy clinic at the Mayo Clinic, as well as attends on the inpatient um, structural heart disease service as well. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Allman to, the, to our great round. Thank you very much. It really has been a fun uh, uh, experience with the fellows. They've been fabulous uh, hosts and really impressed with their interactions with one another during the time uh, here. Uh, this is a picture of Rochester, Minnesota, but not this week. Um, there are barely any buds on those trees, and there's a winter storm warning for tomorrow, forecasting four to nine inches of snow. So I'm going to stay in Washington over the weekend and let all that go past. So. Um, I have no disclosures for this talk or any other, and I'm going to kind of give you our current uh, thoughts on the management of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And since this was focused on the fellows, I've labeled some of the slides with this big orange box that says knowledge gaps, which would make great research opportunities for anyone who's looking for something to do. So um, we just passed the 60th anniversary of the first publication that is felt to be about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This was uh, published out of uh, London uh, in 1958. It was a case series, so these are the first uh, eight patients felt to have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and the notable thing about this is this is an autopsy series. So at this time, HCM was universally fatal by age 45, uh, was, was the thought, obviously. We've obviously learned a lot more about it since then. Um, and this is kind of, every time I meet with a patient, what I hope they take away from our consultation when they see us in clinic. First of all, they need to know that they're not alone. While it's not a common disease, it's not exceedingly rare. That it can have some family inheritance uh, implications. It can be compatible with a normal lifespan and a good quality of life, but there is the uh, issue of sudden cardiac death uh, that we have to tackle that we use medications to treat symptoms, and then this kind of lingering issue of how much exercise can someone diagnosed with this disease uh, participate in. So we'll kind of talk about each of these. Um, and so uh, Dr. Owen and team here has a strong uh, interest in the genetics of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And I think 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we had lots of promise that genetics were going to give us these great answers about how to risk stratify and manage patients with HCM. And I think it has actually asked more questions than it's answered at this point. And I've listed a few of them on the slide here. So why do all of these mutations, hundreds of them, result in a phenotype of HCM? Why is that phenotype? different from person to person with hypertrophy in different segments of the heart, despite the fact that the gene is everywhere in the heart. Um, why do mutations in myosin heavy chain result in dilated cardiomyopathy in some patients and hypertrophic cardiomyopathies in others or non-compaction syndrome in others? 
And then we've got this interesting publication that just came out last year from a multi-center a collaborative of uh, genetic research centers in HCM. And you can see uh, that patients who are negative for any sarcomeric mutations, which are still about 40 to 60 percent of the patients that we see that clearly have phenotymic HCM, have better survival free of uh, complications compared to those who have a pathogenic mutation in green or even a VUS in blue. So there is some information in the genetics of it, but we don't know what all that means yet and, and how to use it uh, clinically very well. So again, more, more research opportunities for enterprising young cardiovascular geneticists. We use genetic testing now purely as a, as a way to screen families is, is the main issue. And if they don't have a positive genetic test or the family chooses not to pursue it because it can be expensive for families to do, then the screening is typically an echocardiogram every five years in adult first degree relatives and annually in adolescents is the current recommendations. Now, as opposed to that Donald Tier paper with 100% fatality by age 45, uh, we've had emerging data now that, that as we've learned more about the, popu the true population of patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, that maybe those, that was just the tip of the iceberg, obviously, like we've seen in other diseases. So the very earliest cohorts had a 6% annual mortality. The most recent cohorts, this one published um, 2015, suggests that the annual mortality is between a half and 1% per year. Uh, which you know, these authors were saying is not so different than the general population. But again, in that, in that multi-center cohort, it, that same signal isn't exactly seen here. So focus your attention um, in this segment. The red bars are um, death in non-familial HCM patients. So these are, non, these are sarcomere negative phenotypic HCM patients. And in young patients, there's no excess mortality among HCM. But over the age of 40, we start to see uh, a trend. This is not statistically significant. But when you lump in those who have sarcomere positive mutations here, then these start to have statistical significance. So there probably is a higher mortality rate. And these graphs all show that the younger the onset of the disease, the higher the cumulative event rate of ventricular arrhythmias, heart failure symptoms, or AFib. So early onset disease is worse than late onset disease in terms of the patient long-term outcomes. The other thing that we published uh, from Mayo uh, in 2017 is this uh, analysis that showed that women with HCM in the solid red line have worse survival than men with HCM and the general population of men and women in the DASH line. And, and we really were not able to find a signal to say why that should be. And we've seen that in a couple of other studies uh, since then that suggests that there is something, uh, there's some signal here that, that women don't do as well with HCM uh, than men. They do present later. They present with uh, less symptoms early, but more heart failure late. And most of these deaths were heart failure deaths and not sudden cardiac deaths. Um, so uh, perhaps less recognition of disease early, less aggressive <coughs> treatments. Some, some of the similar hypotheses have been proposed for other uh, gender-based differences in outcomes. So more research to be done, fellows. Um, now, sudden cardiac death is one of the more uh, challenging aspects of every consultation with a patient with HCM because a 1% rate of annual death is a really uncomfortable number. It's too rare to have strong recommendations that most patients should get defibrillators and too frequent to blow it off. You, ha you have to have a, a, a deep conversation with each patient. And I'm gonna just show, this, this is a patient that I saw, uh, you can see I first saw him in 2008 and he's actually from this region of the country. He had non-obstructive HCM. Uh, with a wall thickness of about 21 millimeters. He was a very active individual who was asymptomatic. Um, he was on a little bit of beta blocker, if I remember correctly. Um, he didn't have a Holter monitor yet, so we told him he needed to get that done and send it to us. Um, and then we gave him the usual recommendation that he shouldn't participate in competitive sports, but he could be an active, healthy person. Um, and then the next I heard was three months later, um, when he had died. Uh, with some friends while they were out hiking. Um, 
So this is, this is the challenge. Um, there's, there is no way to identify a zero risk individual and all of the risk factors that we know uh, have, str have poor positive predictive value. Um, there's been probably dozens of markers that have been associated with sudden cardiac death in HCM. Those in the blue boxes here are the ones that have uh, had the longest and uh, most robust uh, data to support them. Notably, the only one that has anything to do with arrhythmia is non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. Um, certainly family history of sudden death in a first degree relative uh, is felt to be an issue. By unexplained syncope, we mean not vasovagal syncope, so something that sounds scary for an arrhythmia-based syncope. The severity of the LVH is, is worrisome. Um, this one is kind of falling off. There's less support for this one more and more, the abnormal blood pressure response to exercise. Notably here, the genetic mutations, at one time there was lots of interest that maybe there were mutations that identified that highest risk group. That appears to be a referral bias or founder effect issue in those patients, because when you look at unrelated patients, there doesn't seem to be any mutation that is more malignant or more benign than the others. Um, Outflow tract obstruction is associated with sudden cardiac death, but it's a moving target. The gradient changes every few minutes based on whether the patient's sitting, standing, lying, walking, how warm the room is. And so it's hard to pin someone's risk on something that's moving every few seconds uh, as a risk marker. And probably that's how this comes into play, the abnormal blood pressure response to exercise in some ways. Emerging more and more is this issue of fibrosis or scarring on CMR. The higher the scar burden, the higher the risk of arrhythmic events in HCM. And in particular, uh, an aneurysm at the LV apex is also emerging as a pretty strong risk marker for sudden cardiac death. So how do we use these when we talk to patients? Well, before 2011, you basically added up the risk factors uh, and then made a recommendation for defibrillator based on that. And so, obviously, if someone had had a clinical event, you had resuscitated them or they had a sustained ventricular arrhythmia, they had an indication for defibrillator. But there was this great controversy perpetuated at all the annual meetings, AHA, ACC, ESC, debating how many risk factors did you need in order to put in a defibrillator. And it, it largely broke across the Atlantic Ocean that if you were in North America, you were comfortable in some patients recommending a defibrillator with one or more risk factors. And if you lived in Europe, you were comfortable if it was two or more risk factors. It's the debate between sensitivity and not missing sudden deaths and specificity not over implanting uh, defibrillators. Then in 2010, essentially, uh, the uh, ACCAHA put together a, a guideline committee to talk about the management of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I was able to participate in that as one of the writing committee members. And we looked at the literature uh, of the various risk factors and used expert opinion uh, as is necessary in this disease because there is just not the randomized controlled trials and uh, large studies to have lots of level of evidence A and B data. But in looking at the data, we felt that these three risk markers actually had more weight in the literature in terms of their association with sudden cardiac death. So felt that the presence of any one of these could give you a class 2A indication for a defibrillator. These two were less strong, but if they had some other mitigating factor, near risk factors or funny histories, then they could be a class 2A. But if they were in isolation, it would be a class 2B indications. And in the absence of that, a defibrillator wasn't recommended. So we felt like that moved things forward, made it easier in some ways by weighting these risk factors. But it's, this methodology still suffers from the fact that something like wall thickness is a continuous variable. And the risk doesn't suddenly increase when you hit 30 millimeters. It, it gradually increases over time. So we, we force continuous variables to be binary by drawing arbitrary cutoff values. And shortly thereafter, uh, our colleagues in the UK developed a regression equation that used continuous variables continuously uh, to predict a five-year estimate risk for sudden death for HCM patients, and they incorporated that into the ESC guideline, which was published in two 2014. 
And as part of that, they um, developed this SCD risk calculator for HCM that you put in the variables of interest about the patient here, and it gives you two components of output. The first one is an estimated five-year risk of sudden cardiac death. And then the ESC recommendation around defibrillators is tied to that. And that recommendation uh, is tied to anything under 4% is essentially a class 3 recommendation. Between 4 and 6% was a class 2B recommendation, and above 6% was considered class 2A, essentially. This part has been validated in more than 8,000 patients. This part was arbitrary discussion by the writing committee of what constitutes a sufficient threshold to put a defibrillator in. Um, this is the part that, that I think uh, is problematic because when, when someone has severe mitral regurgitation, they have an indication for operation if they have symptoms. And then you might calculate the STS risk to talk to the patient about what their risk is, and then they decide whether they want a defibrillator. You don't do it the other way around and calculate the risk and say, if your risk is above a certain value or below a certain value, then you do the procedure. It's the patient's perception of the risk in the conversation with their doctor that helps make that decision. That's the shared decision-making process. And this is kind of illustrated uh, by these five patients, or all patients that I have seen as well. So the first one is a young woman with multiple family members who had had arrhythmic, arrhythmogenic deaths. The next one is a young person with almost 30 millimeters of hypertrophy and non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. The next one is a 47-year-old lawyer. I'm not sure whether that's a risk factor or not, but it certainly ups the ante when you're having that discussion, uh, who had non-sustained ventricular tachycardia and a, and a hypotensive response to exercise. This gentleman with really thick heart and a positive family history of sudden cardiac death, and this young man with no risk factors. So again, before 2011, if you were doing risk factor counting and you uh, lived in North America, it was you would probably put a defibrillator in both of those blue boxes and you might consider it in the top two. If you were a European cardiologist, you would probably recommend a defibrillator for those two, but not the other two. With the 2011 guidelines, all of those patients, it is reasonable to offer them a defibrillator. Using that ESC methodology, you would have changed which two patients you recommended a defibrillator to. So who's right? These are the outcomes of the patients. The first three are alive. Although, by the way, none of these patients had, they all chose not to get defibrillators in their discussions. So the first three are alive. The last two both had sudden cardiac death events. Um, you know, so again, notably, zero risk factors doesn't mean zero risk. And in fact, the ESC calculator, which I used as part of the discussion with that patient, said, yes, there's still some value of risk here. Um, and his family actually called me and thanked me for that discussion because this didn't take them by surprise. They knew that there was some risk that it was, he chose that that was too low for him to intervene upon and the lack of risk factors, we wouldn't have recommended a defibrillator anyway. Likewise, this person's uh, girlfriend called me to give me this news and also said, I appreciate that conversation. I know he chose not to get a defibrillator even though I had recommended it. And she said, I just wanted to let you know that was the follow-up. So the risk tool, the percentage is very helpful in the discussions. But these things aren't right or wrong because the risk assessment doesn't tell you whether that patient should get a defibrillator or not. The risk assessment tool isn't the final decision. It's part of shared decision making. So our job as clinicians, as doctors, is to identify features that, ident that have a patient identified as high risk. What is discuss the magnitude of that risk with the patient. What are the risk and benefits of their treatment options? And then allow the patient to participate in the discussion. So when you tell someone they have a 6% risk of sudden cardiac death in five years, that scares some people. Some people hear that and say, that means I have a 94% chance of nothing happening in five years? I'm pretty good with that. And it, each person brings their own risk tolerance to that discussion, and it depends on their life circumstances, how old they are, how old their kids are. Faith comes into that for some people. So the individual patient uh, has a risk expression. <clears throat> 
And so guideline models like this are not intended to tell you what to do for each and every patient. They give you a framework of which to have a counseling session with your patient to help them make the best decision for them in their circumstances. And so that ACC guideline is really a higher sensitivity first pass screen to identify patients that have some risk for a sudden cardiac death and the risk tool allows you to individualize that risk for the patient and have that discussion with them. I don't think we should be using dogmatic arbitrary cutoff points to recommend a defibrillator based on four or six percent because that's not allowing the patient to participate in that discussion. That's a paternalistic approach to uh, recommending medical therapies. So this is sudden cardiac death risk is always going to be a knowledge gap for us and uh, Christian as an electrophysiologist uh, more research there would be helpful as well. Um, here are some things that we're doing. Um, this was a poster we presented uh, last year at AHA and this used natural language processing on the EHR and the NLP algorithm was better identifying risk markers in the EHR than the clinicians had indicated in their final diagnoses or impressions of their notes and so the machine learning AI approaches are going to give us more information. We've now got a neural network program that can, can look at the ECG signals, the raw ECG signals, not the filter ones, and are identifying patients who have higher risk for sudden cardiac death and actually diagnosing people who are likely to have HCM even though the official read of the ECG says normal ECG. In those neural networks, you don't know what it's looking at, but it's, it's remarkable how often it, uh, it is performing in our uh, early tests. So I do think the era of big data, machine learning, and augmented human intelligence are gonna be the next wave of information that we're gonna be using to help identify patients with increased risk. So next, we're gonna talk about uh, treatment of symptoms in HCM. So we don't start medications just because they have a diagnosis of HCM. The medications have only been proven to mitigate symptoms. They don't have any survival uh, benefit for patients with HCM. Um, so you've got a strong uh, echo presence here. You understand the mechanisms of systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve uh, with blood pushing the mitral valve into the outflow tract and resulting in uh, posteriorly directed mitral regurgitation. This is present in about three-fourths of patients with HCM either at rest or with simple provocation. Um, it is very dynamic as I mentioned, so the gradient is worse in states of increased contractility or decreased preload or decreased afterload, all of which happen as soon as the patient stands up from the echo table and walks out through the lobby. So the gradient you get in the echo lab is probably the lowest it's been in that hour. Uh, it's probably higher when they're leaving, um, uh, which is, which is uh, you know, it's why it's manipulable. It's why the medications can work because if we can change the loading conditions, we can, we can push the gradients below uh, the threshold that's causing that individual patient symptoms. Kind of by fiat, people are deemed as having obstructive HCM if they have a peak gradient of 30 millimeters. But we really don't think that gradients below 40 to 50 are sufficient to give someone class three symptoms. If you have someone who has class three dyspnea and they have a gradient that's 30, you need to look for another cause for their dyspnea. Um, something else is going on. But provocation is important. And so in our echo lab, we have a, the, the sonographers know that if they have an, an HCM patient and they, and they don't get a gradient of more than 40 to 50 at rest, then they'll automatically do valsalve maneuvers. And if they don't get a gradient of more than 40 to 50 with that, then they ask one of the nurses to come in and they either do squat to stand maneuvers or they do amyl nitride inhalation to try to provoke just in that basic initial echocardiogram. At that point, if they don't have a gradient of 40 to 50, then it, then it comes to us in the clinic and we decide whether a stress echo might be the way to go. But this way we get most of our gradient information from their initial echocardiogram they get at the lab and only have to use stress echo uh, when the patient has symptoms that sound obstructive and the echo lab just didn't approve it on the first pass through. The medical therapy for HCM has been fairly stagnant for a number of years. The first line therapies are beta blockers or the non-dihydropyridine class calcium channel blockers because they are negative inotropes. 
so they decrease contractility. They're also negative chronotropes, so they slow the heart rate down, which prolongs the diastolic filling period, which increases your preload. Um, disapyramide can be added to one of the other two if need be. It's got a success rate of about 60% uh, among patients that, uh, that have used it. It comes with a lot of baggage in terms of side effects, um, but it is a useful medication for some people. I've had lots of success at removing vasodilators from people's medication lists. They're on amlodipine or an, or, an, or an ACE inhibitor for some mild hypertension, and then they have symptoms, and if you replace the vasodilator with one of these, you can control their hypertension and uh, eliminate their outflow tract obstruction more. If you have problems with hypertension, I still think a very low dose thiazide diuretic in addition to one of these is a, is a useful and, and doesn't tend to provoke symptoms in most people. And we do talk to our patients about maintaining their preload. So what's the knowledge gap in the symptoms realm? So first of all, it's not universal that patients who have a gradient above 80 are symptomatic and patients who have gradients less than 50 are asymptomatic. Um, don't quite understand that. We talked about that a little bit yesterday with Dr. Otto and how that tracks kind of similar to the aortic stenosis patients. The gradient doesn't track that closely with symptoms. We are increasingly faced with the problem of patients who are getting larger, uh, and so they may have more than one reason for shortness of breath, and how do you sort that out when, you're, when you've got a patient who's short of breath and has outflow tract obstruction, or even more, in terms of cardiac physiology, how do we figure out when the patient's symptoms are primarily due to diastolic dysfunction versus obstruction, and does it matter? We do have a small series of our patients who underwent ablation and looked at the responders and non-responders non susceptible to ablation, and those who didn't respond seemed to have worse diastolic filling. So if you could detect that ahead of time, you might counsel your patient differently about expectations of doing the procedure. I don't know that you would deny patients the procedure if you thought they had significant diastolic dysfunction because the afterload effects of the obstruction impact the diastole as well, but you would maybe not paint them as rosy a picture about eradication of symptoms, but maybe you would just improve the symptoms. And then I know that, you, that, that uh, David and team are involved with the new study of, uh, of Mavic Hampton, and we'll talk about that. So the original drug trials in HCM uh, were a long time ago. We've had a number of failures at attempting new medication trials in HCM more recently. Uh, and, but now Mavacamptin is this modulator of the, of the interaction between myosin and actin, uh, potent negative inotrope, and in the initial study, um, it was able to successfully reduce the gradient in a number of patients, but did drop the EF significantly. Two-thirds of the patient had symptom improvement and an improvement in VO2, so there's, there's, this looks good. Um, there were a few patients in whom the EF was significantly impaired, uh, and while well, looking at a 70% improvement, 30% didn't show much improvement at all. So there's larger trials ongoing now, both in obstructive HCM and non-obstructive HCM, that we'll be very anxious to get the results of to see uh, if this is a medication that's going to help us uh, treat patients without doing invasive procedures more often. So that's my segue to when we do invasive therapy. And so we only offer these procedures to patients who have symptoms that haven't responded to medical therapy or the medical therapy adds side effects that are just as bad as the original symptoms were. And whether you're having myectomy or ablation, those are the same three basic indications. Here's what we know uh, over time. Uh, the operative mortality for surgical myectomy uh, in experienced centers is quite low. It's now about 0.4% at the uh, three or four uh, highest volume surgical centers in the country. The gradient can be virtually abolished and you know, excellent uh, post-op symptom improvement. This is data from our institution that shows patients who have had myectomy have survival that's statistically equivalent to the general population. And this is a study of patients who all had ICDs because they had risk factors for sudden cardiac death and met, met indications for ICD placement, and there's no difference in their risk factor profiles. But among patients who then had myectomy, the rate of appropriate ICD discharge is about 20-fold lower than the patients who didn't need a myectomy or didn't qualify for a myectomy. 
So while we don't offer operation for survival effects, we offer it for quality of life, symptom improvement, I think we can be confident in counseling our patients that it is not going to hasten their, uh, their death and may be helpful. Ablation, we can't call a new kid on the block anymore. It's been around for a long time and uh, has increasing evidence of its efficacy. Great gradient reduction. The symptom improvement among responders is similar to the symptom improvement among myectomy responders. The complication rates that were initially high when we were using very high doses of alcohol are much better, more like 5 to 10 percent now complication rate. And the mortality rate uh, early and late uh, is, is uh, also getting better as we've gained more experience with this procedure. Uh, these are again Mayo data showing that among our patients, survival free from recurrent symptoms is equivalent between myectomy and ablation amongst the patients we've treated that way. Unless the patient is young, defined as under the age of 65, and those younger patients seem to do much better with myectomy than with ablation in terms of symptom-free survival. And this shows that uh, the patients who have ablation uh, have a need for re-intervention more often. Uh, as a whole, about 10% of patients undergoing ablation need more than one procedure to get them to their ultimate symptom uh, benefit uh, range. So if we were going to create a, uh, a scorecard uh, for these uh, primary things that patients and providers are worried about, the gradient, need for pacemakers, death, length of stay, pain, how quickly can they get back to work or school, symptom improvement, reintervention rates, and survival. You know, there's pros and cons to each of these. And so again, for our patients who have symptoms, despite medical therapy, we talk to them about each of the procedures. Um, there are a few predictors of things that would favor myectomy over ablation in our mind. So again, the younger the patient, the more likely surgery is going to uh, have a benefit. We know that the, th the heart muscle is more than 24 millimeters thick and gradients over 80. Uh, the surgeons can do a more complete uh, attack on that gradient than the, than the catheter can. Uh, so we can use some of those criteria from, from one of our interventional colleagues to help se select cases more appropriately. Now, there's also the issue of uh, what is expertise and what is volume, and it's, it's important that people that, whichever procedure they're doing, do a lot of them, and they do it in the context of a center like you all have here, where you have experts who understand the management of HCM generally. So this was a study published in 2016 and this is just showing the uh, myectomy data, but the same holds true directionally for ablation. Um, looking at a national discharge database and did tertiles of volume, and you can see, as you would expect, that higher volume centers had lower operative mortality. There's a, there's a new statistic I created here, though, that's called the number needed to kill. So if you have your operation done at one of these, one in six of their patients was having a 30-day death. One in six. Even at the so-called high-volume centers, it was one in 20. At the four highest-volume HCM surgical centers, 0.04% uh, you know, death rate. Um, so there's a, we would, shouldn't be having every regional hospital offer invasive procedures for disease that isn't common. It's just like the ACHD. You need to know how to manage the basics of it. When it starts to get complicated, then it probably needs to go somewhere like, like UW, Mayo, Cleveland, one of those places where the teams uh, do a lot of these. Some of the centers here were doing one myectomy a year. And I've made the joke that I wouldn't let someone cut my hair if they only did it once a year. And this is a pretty simple haircut. Um, so why would we let our family members do that? And, and people would say, well, gosh, you're, you're being self-serving. They should come to you. I, I would say that it's more self-serving to offer them an operation if these are your event rates than to offer the patient referral to somewhere that has good outcomes. So um, the volume and expertise matter. Going to switch gears slightly to the non-obstructive or the non-outflow tract obstruction patients. Again, as I mentioned before, these LV apical aneurysms have been associated with a higher stroke rate 
among HCM patients and also a higher sudden cardiac death rate. Um, this depiction is trying to show one theory for why these aneurysms develop. They aren't present from birth and that the theory is, is that these are actually apical HCM patients who have ongoing ischemia and scarring at the apex that eventually dilates and becomes aneurysmal. And then somewhere in here, they actually develop a mid-cavity obstruction between this apical cavity and the, and the basal uh, LV cavity. Um, and how you manage those things. You can get gradients here that are 60 to 80 millimeters of mercury, and they can have similar symptoms to patients with LV outflow tract obstruction. So we will do myectomies to relieve mid-ventricular obstruction as well if the medications aren't successful. Sometimes the surgeon can't reach that. So the typical myectomy is done through an aortic incision and operating through the aortic valve. And if they can't reach all of that through there, then they can go in through the aneurysm, the aneurysm to, to get the distal end of that uh, muscle mass. But we've also seen a number of patients who have so much hypertrophy that they have a very small cavity and a very small stroke volume and stroke volume reserve. And Traditionally, those patients are then eligible for transplant if they uh, have refractory heart failure symptoms. But Dr. Schaff, who's our uh, senior cardiovascular surgeon, thought, wouldn't it be better to try to remodel their cavity than give them someone else's heart if it's effective? And so he pioneered this procedure of, uh, I'll actually go to the next slide, um, doing an apical myectomy, uh, where you go in uh, and resect and give them a larger cavity. Uh, and that is best demonstrated on these long axis MR uh, images. So this is pre-op, uh, long axis of the LV, and then after the apical resection. This is this patient's uh, pressure volume loops pre-op and post-op. So you can see the stroke volume increased and LV EDP was decreased uh, by giving them a, a, a cavity enlargement. This is a very small number of patients who are eligible for this. They have to have a small cavity or a very small stroke volume reserve, and they have to have really advanced symptoms. These are not patients who have class two symptoms. These are patients who, who we are seriously contemplating whether or not they should be listed for transplant, or do we have something that we can, we can offer them short of that. These data uh, back here show that the initial experience, um, there was uh, about a 4% mortality. That's gotten better since then. The overall, about two thirds of the patients maintained symptom improvement status, but one third of the patients then redeveloped symptoms and two of them have gone on to subsequent transplant. So the success rate isn't the 95% we quote for the subaortic myectomy for outflow tract obstruction, but uh, it is something that we still offer patients when they are having that advanced heart failure presentation and a small cavity. Uh, again, these are the data showing the change in stroke volume and the change in LVDP in, the, in a, the very initial series of patients. Then the last thing we'll address this morning is this issue of exercise and how much is too much and what should we allow or approve, et cetera. So we know that traditionally it's been taught to us that because of data that HCM patients die during or shortly after moderate intensity efforts, that therefore it's dangerous for HCM patients to exercise, they shouldn't participate in competitive athletics, and they probably shouldn't seriously exercise. Um, I think that is probably a little heavy-handed uh, based on what we uh, know. Um, this is kind of uh, back of the napkin math, um, but there are about 400,000 NCAA and, uh, athletes, and there's about nine deaths each year amongst them. It's been reported that 40% of death amongst athletes is due to HCM, and so three or four of those deaths each year are due to HCM. There's a study been published that said among athletes, the prevalence of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is much lower than the general population, but at 0.08%, which means there's 300 to 400 patients with HCM playing college sports. And so if the sudden cardiac death rate is 1% per year, you would expect that there would be three deaths each year due to HCM amongst those athletes if the risk is equivalent. If risk was higher amongst athletes because of the effort they're putting there, you, you would think that number would be higher. This is not a randomized study. This isn't a case control study. Uh, but it just is a, it, it's just a notion to us that the death rate isn't much higher amongst athletes 
the fact that it hits the front page of the sports section is much higher than when a citizen uh, dies from their HCM, but it doesn't mean that the rate is higher. We had a study published uh, now two years ago uh, among patients with cardiovascular disease who had sufficient risk markers to get a defibrillator. So this included HCM patients, long QT patients, and ARVD patients, uh, who then chose to continue to participate in their sport with their defibrillator in place. So there was no arrhythmia-related deaths amongst these people, no difference in the rate of appropriate discharges, and uh, uh, ICD shock was most common in patients with ARVC. Uh, but the, the result of this study is that among patients with sufficient risk to warrant a defibrillator, it appears safe for them to participate with their defibrillator without untoward consequences. So the approach in our clinic uh, has been that rather than dogmatically telling patients they can't play, uh, that we talk to them about the fact that there is a perception of risk with extreme efforts. Um, then we talk to them about the, their right to choose the level of activity they have, but we do want them to be healthy. Uh, we feel that those with sufficient risk to warrant an implant can feel safe continuing to play if they have it, but we don't use a desire to play as a reason to put a defibrillator in. That would be the cart before the horse. Um, and if for patients who don't have an ICD and with HCM, we recommend that their training and performance facilities have AEDs or trained personnel uh, available during practice and, and uh, their games. More work will need to be done in this space. I know of one study that's going on that's looking at the effects and safety of high intensity interval training among HCM patients. Um, so people are more interested in exploring this so we aren't limiting our patients and turning them into metabolically unhealthy individuals with HCM uh, and allowing them to participate in life like the rest of us would like to. So I will conclude uh, with this. I, I stumbled across this quote a few years ago that talks about uh, how the science of medicine brings us forward, but it's the art of medicine that allows us to translate the data into stuff that helps patients uh, make choices about their own care and part of what called us all to become doctors. So thank you very much. So the question is, is there any utility for an implantable loop recorder? I think a few instances, obviously palpitations or, or pre syncopal spells that you haven't been able to sort out just like you would for any other patient. Um, I do have one patient who um, I feel has sufficient risk that I thought a defibrillator was a, was a pretty good idea. They weren't sold on it yet, but we decided that we would do a loop recorder uh, to see if he was having more non-sustained VT than we can appreciate on the other monitoring. So I think there are some instances where you, where you can use that, that technology. Yeah. Yeah. That was a fantastic talk. Um, one of the issues that over the years has been very controversial is the uh, septal ablation in the cath lab versus uh, surgical myectomy. Mm -hmm. And you know, a patient would always choose going to the cath lab, right? If they were told they were equivalent, why not? I mean, mm -hmm. it's shorter procedures, less pain, get back to the original quickly. But you know, one of the controversies is that Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, so the data are mixed on sudden cardiac death following septal ablation. Um, the large study from the Baylor group back when uh, they were uh, doing a lot of ablations there would suggest the rate of ICD discharge or sudden deaths following ablation was um, similar to that after myectomy. But if you look at an international HCM ICD registry of patients, the rate of appropriate ICD discharge following ablation was the same as the rate of appropriate ICD discharge among secondary prevention ICDs. So almost 10% per year. So we have conflicting data on that and consistent data around the sudden cardiac death risk being lower amongst different series among patients with myectomy. So my counseling with patients usually is um, if they have sudden cardiac death risk features but they're not interested in a defibrillator, I tell them that the ablation might be 
uh, n might not be their best choice because of this uncertain risk and potential for that scar to be arrhythmogenic. If they're going to have myectomy, then, then you know, there might be some mitigation of that risk. We, we, uh, we um, wrote an editorial a couple of years ago about that, and, and we felt like it would be, uh, we would have to recruit more patients that have ever been reported in the literature in HCM to do that. So we used the data on uh, enrollment rates amongst the Berry trial, you know, the number of people you approach who are eligible versus those who agree to be in it, and the fact that the SCD rate is so low amongst the myectomy patients that you would have to recruit 64,000 patients to be randomized to to be powered enough to detect a difference. So, it takes that many, does it matter? I mean, if it takes that many people to tell a difference, does a difference matter? Right. Uh, that was a great talk, thanks. Got one sort of simple, straightforward. The map of Hampton, you said there was a significant proportion whose EF dropped below 45%. Is that reversible when you stop the medication? I'll ask David. <laughs> Yep. Uh, I, I, was, I was being entertained by the fellows last night, so I wasn't watching ESPN. I was spending quality time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The Green Bay Packers, thank you for that draft pick, by the way. Yeah. Our pleasure to do it Yeah. Every year. yeah. That's, that's the crux of the problem. The problem is, is that I haven't proven to you the risk is no different. I just have some math that would suggest it might not be elevated. So our conversation... So is the data that suggests yep. it is? Ag agreed. Agreed. So the conversation I have with those type of individuals are, it is the individual's choice about how much activity they want to do, but it would be the employer's or the university's choice about the, whether they wanted to employ or recruit someone with that. So while that player may choose to, he, he would choose to play if he could, then he has to find a team who is willing to, to take the risk that he might not, might not do that. And I've had that conversation on draft day with an owner who said, I need to know, is this guy going to die in the next two years? <laughs> said, <laughs> said this. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. what you believe is a high risk yep. activity, even though they don't meet the normal criteria, do you recommend? No, I, th I, I, wait, I feel like that's a really slippery slope to start putting in defibrillators to allow people to play. Um, so uh, we, we have that conversation and, and I think the way that we, ha so Mike Ackerman and I are the two that primarily talk to those people at our institution. We feel pretty comfortable that that conversation is thorough and that they understand that, that, that there, there may be some risk and they're willing to do that because as you say, it might be millions of dollars and that person's only thing they're, they're trained to, to help their finan family financially, et cetera. So. Yep. Yeah. 
I, I think that would be interesting, and, and I do think that, that uh, similar to heart failure, there's a higher rate of diastolic dysfunction or HEFPEF in general heart failure in women as compared to men. So I think some of those things are probably at play here as well. So um, if they have no traditional risk factors, I actually say what I said, that doesn't mean you have zero risk, but, but we, we don't think there's sufficient risk for us to have you undergo a procedure to have this device that has some, some complications to it. The MRI is, is interesting, the scanning the MRI, so um, if they really have 15 or 20 percent of their LV replaced by SCAR, I think, uh, I, have, I don't, can't remember an individual patient where I put in a defibrillator solely because of that, but that might be the person who I do the more prolonged monitoring on, because if I found non-sustained VT in that person, then I'm going to recommend an ICD for them. A AED is successful. Resuscitation uh, using standard CPR, uh, there's a shorter window for it to be effective among a amongst HCM patients because the thick muscle just doesn't, it, it becomes more res refractory to defibrillation if you have to wait for the defibrillation to occur. Oh, AED in the public is, is effective as long as there's someone there uh, to, to grab the device and use it. So, so we have lots of patients who say, well, should I just get an AED from my home? And I said, that's great if, you're, if you've always got someone at home with you that knows how to use it. But if, if your partner goes off to work for 10 hours a day and you're at home with your AED, you're... you're, you're <laughs> <laughs> that James Bond did it himself. No, no, actually, though, Vesper had to eventually come in and give him the epi in his heart, so... <laughs> Oh, okay. When you're screening family members of a program that has HCM, given the variable uh, presentation of the, the phenotype, at what point, at what age do you say, okay, we're done? Mm. Yeah, so there's been a few case reports of people presenting for the f for in their fifth or sixth decade of life after prior normal thickness echocardiograms, but it's a few cases, not a, a, a common thing. So our standard recommendation is uh, if you get to mid-60s and you've, you've had normal echoes until then, uh, it's unlikely to recur after, to occur after that. So if they've had the echo earlier, yeah. Yeah, every five years, yeah, every five years in, in young and middle-aged adults, yeah. Do you guys have any experience or uh, do you have thoughts about um, radiofrequency ablation for septal reduction versus alcohol septal ablation or myectomy? Yeah, so we're, we, uh, um, Doug Packer's lab has looked at a number of te techniques to see if we can directly treat the septum with RFA or electroporation actually is one thing they're looking at to see if there's a, a better way to ablate from that side of the septum without increasing debris that might cause stroke and those kind of things, but it's still in the animal labs at this point. Uh, I have not used that, and we don't, we don't, I, don't, I haven't seen any data to, to support that. I mean, some of those trials that were failures were attempts to use modulators of fibrosis like aldosterone or the uh, tissue-specific ACE inhibitors, and they just didn't show any signal in the, in the small studies that were done in the human studies. David. Mm-hmm.
No, I mean, I, I guess we have some, some hope that Mavicampton, you know, because they're studying that in the non-obstructives, there's some theory behind why that can help in that. We had thoughts that aldosterone antagonists might do it and it didn't help with that. So I do think that is a, that's really uncharted territory, but just like HEFPEF, uh, we just aren't making much gains in, in how we, we attack that, that entity um, other than surface, you know, adding diuretics for m mitigation of symptoms to a degree. It's, it's, a, it's a really big challenge, you're absolutely right. right. Oh, thank you very much.